in what general locations did you serve? In Vietnam? Quite a few. Uh, Lai Kei, uh, Dao Tien, uh, Ku Chi, uh, Long Bin for a couple of weeks. I think I mentioned Ku Chi, and that's about it. Um, and of those, which one was the most intense? Ku Chi by far. Ku Chi. What, kind of, what kind of fighting did that entail? Uh, I was in the infantry. Ku Chi had a lot of tunnels. Uh, so we used a lot of tunnel rats because we had to get down there and find out what was going on down there. Some of those tunnels in Kuchi were a couple of miles long. Wow. Today, there are, today those tunnels are a tourist attraction. Wow. And uh, what was the process you would you have to do in order to clear those, um, those holes in the tunnel back? We usually sent the smallest guy in our squad, and he had to get wow. down into the tunnel and fish him out. And there was no easy way to do it. Did you ever just blow up the entrance, or would there just? No, no, we never did that because there could have been civilians down there. Yeah. So we never blew up a, a tunnel. Uh, um, and we'll we'll get back to that more and what you did later. But um, just for jogging your memory, um, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. Um, where were you living at the time? Uh, I was living at the time in Waterbury, Connecticut. Waterbury, right here, Waterbury, Connecticut. Were there a lot of um, your friends that had also gotten um, drafted from there? Uh, just a few. Um, do you recall the date that, that you got um, enlisted? Or not enlisted, uh, you got drafted? July 1969. Um, uh, like, like a lot of um, people who went there, there were faces the um, option of fleeing or um, going to Canada or serving. Um, and I was wondering, um, with all the um, counterculture and anti-war, um, what made you want to, if you were a part of that at all, what made you want to go there? I just wanted to serve my country uh, and make sure that we were able to keep the communists at bay. Uh, the thing that I mo remember the most about the Vietnam War was uh, when we came back, when I came back to the United States, uh, we did not get a warm reception. Yeah, unlike in World War II where there were parades and stuff like that, there were just Vietnam more... was just the opposite. Is that because of the public dislike of the war? Right, that was because of the public dislike, all the protest that we shouldn't be there. Uh, and, uh, it was a very unpleasant experience coming home. And um, to some extent, um, it divided the entire country into two, almost just two different opinions. Absolutely, you're war. absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So is that that kind of must have been a hard thing for society to take. Is like, what kind of government do we have if we can't um, have a say in what kind of a war we're going to get ourselves into? <coughs> cool. Um, so. Why did you take the service, or did you take the, your service branch, or did you just end up in infantry? I ended up in infantry. Um, tell me about your first days in service. Pardon me? Tell me about your first days in service. Uh, well, I took my basic and AIT training, which is advanced infantry training, at Fort Six, New Jersey, and uh, got used to getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and uh, was very well disciplined there. Was the training regiment really strict? Yes, it was. Uh, do you think you were, um, what, in what ways do you think you were prepared and unprepared for? Uh, well, initially I found out uh, when I got my MOS, which is 9 Bravo, it was infantry. Uh, from what I was told by several veterans, uh, they put the most intelligent young men into the infantry because they supposedly had the best heads on their shoulders. And the fellows that weren't that sharp, uh, from what I was told, they were the mechanics and cooks and seamen. But being in the infantry, they wanted to put the sharpest guys on the front lines. So I was proud to be in the infantry. Nice. Um, and tell me about your um, boot camp and training experiences. Or I should have asked that. Do you remember your instructors? No, not offhand. Um, and 
Actually, that's that last question. Uh, what else made you proud to be in the Marine Corps? Or in the Army? Uh, I became very fit physically and mentally. Uh, and, uh, you know, looking back at it now, I, I came out of the military uh, physically and mentally a lot better than when I went in. Mm -hmm. um, the last person we interviewed, he said that it was a maturation process. Do you think you, when you came out, you definitely became more globally aware and like aware of like the, pro the problems of society after being in a war like that? Absolutely. But the thing I remember most about being in the Army, especially overseas, uh, whether the fellow next to me was black, Puerto Rican, or Hispanic, there wasn't any discrimination at all. Because they were your brothers out there. Right, because they were looking out for, to save your head just like you were looking to save those. And everyone was treated on an equal basis over there. There was Discrimination was not in anyone's vocabulary. But to come back into the United States, uh, even today, that's not the way it is. Yeah. Um, and in the, in the books, the, um, the things they carried, I remember, um, that's a book about Vietnam, I'm not sure if you read it or not, it's pretty insightful. Um, it was, it's about the things they carried through the war, um, mentally and, and uh, like tangibly. Um, did, did you have any, um, Good luck charms, like so many people did. Not really, no. Was there any kind of a motto that you keep telling yourself to get through the hard times? Uh, well, I had a calendar and I used to mark off the days. So it was almost like that old TV show, One Day at a Time. That's the way I looked at my military service, One Day at a Time. Uh, the last 30 days, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, the term, but your last 30 days, Overseas, you were called a short timer. Okay, and that's the part I remember the most being a short timer. Is that the part that you remember the most because you were so ready to get out of there at the end? Well, it gave you no incentive to really watch what the hell you were doing, especially with the, in lieu of the fact you knew you only had a month to go. You know, if you lasted 11 months, okay, uh, overseas. Uh, yeah, it was, that would, it gave, I think, myself and a lot of other veterans a real incentive to watch what the hell you're doing. Yeah. Um, and then to your experiences, after boot camp, uh, where did you go? Did you go right to Vietnam? Right to Vietnam. <coughs> um, I'm sure you remember perfectly your impression of when you got there. What did you think of it right off the bat, getting off the plane? The day I got off the plane, uh, I felt like I went back 200 years in time. Uh, dirt roads, uh, no indoor plumbing, lighting. I mean, it was it was like living in the prehistoric times. Wow. That's just totally a different world, right? Completely different. Um, and your assignment was um, what exactly? What were you sent there to do? Well, I was in the infantry. I was in the front lines. Um, when, when you got off the plane, um, did you go, where was the first um, base camp that you? Long Bin. Long Bin, and then that was where you met up with your first squad? From Long Bin, I went to Lai Kei. That's where I really hooked up with my first squad. Um, uh, Lai Kei, they used to call, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the term, but I'm, I'm going to give it to you. Uh, Lai Kei was known as Rocket City. And I always asked everyone that had been there a while, why did they call Lyke Rocket City? Well, that's self-explanatory. They're the one, Lyke is the one that always got all the rockets came in. Wow. So when you, when you said that was your main operating base? I was there for quite a while. Uh, how many, probably innumerable rocket attacks fell on you at a certain point, right? Pardon me? How many um, rocket attacks do you remember? Oh, at least, just too many at least a half a dozen big ones. Wow. Um, can you describe a, a typical day for you in the service? Keep your uh, keep your ears and eyes open all the time. So you go out on patrol um, in the during the day. 
we always moved during the day. You didn't move at night. Um, and that's, um, I heard is when the most of the rocket attacks happen, right? During the day. Oh, I thought it was during the night. So, um, uh, I can re specifically remember one time uh, we ran into contact. Uh, so we called it an airstrike, and the airstrike was off by a couple hundred yards. We had to tumble back up. You know, the airstrike almost took us out. Wow. That's crazy. And what was, that, what was the night like for you, like on the, on the base? Uh, well, we were usually in the field seven to ten days. So for seven to ten days, I slept on the ground, uh, usually on an air mattress. And that was it. Um, that sounds like a really hard lifestyle. Um, tell me about, like... Yeah, I, I developed jungle rot because uh, during the monsoon season, you'd be basically sleeping on, on the ground in, in water. Uh, you got to take a shower once a week. Uh -huh. <coughs> so you got used to it. That's the way we lived. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you saw combat, right? Absolutely. Some really heavy fighting. We ran into quite a bit. Uh, but the one thing I distinctly remember, nobody in my squad got killed. No. Uh, wow. uh, we, we, one of the, my best friends was from Philadelphia. And every time the, we ran into contact, he would start screaming and yelling, come on, come on, you guys want to fool around? Come on, come on. And a lot of times we heard him run away. Wow. He says, come on. He says, you guys want to fight? He says, I'll give you a fight. Wow. And a lot of times we heard him run away because they figured he was crazy. He was crazy. <laughs> you said this guy was your friend? Yes. Do you still keep in contact with him? Uh, occasionally. I've had trouble getting a hold of the last couple of years. Uh, one of the fellows in my squad, uh, again, I was in the infantry, and he didn't live in the best part of the United States. Uh, he sent home a mach M60 machine gun piece by piece. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> and this was in 1969, 1970. Wow when, you know, terrorists were not a big factor in the United States, but he sent home a machine gun piece by piece. That's incredible. Um, and what else do you think um, you could associate that zero mortality rate to? Uh, we were always alert and on our toes. Uh, to give you an example, uh, one night when we were back in base camp, uh, we almost saw one of our own men get killed by his own stupidity. Uh, he went out to uh, relieve himself in the, in the bushes because the latrines were all tied up. And when he went outside the perimeter, he didn't tell anybody. And he almost got killed coming back in. By what? Because he didn't tell anybody he was going outside the perimeter. So when they heard movement in the perimeter, they thought it was the enemy oh, coming in. It was him. He wow. almost got shot by his own stupidity. A friendly fire almost. Exactly. Because wow. he was stupid. <laughs> he never did that again. Good for him. At least he learned from his mistakes. <laughs> um, and I'm assuming that no one was ever captured in your squad? Never. Um, the thing I remember most about Vietnam... When my year was up, uh, everybody got their stateside orders. And my orders were APO. And he said, Bob, you're going back overseas. I said, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. From Vietnam, they sent me to Alaska. What? That's crazy. For my last six months. So I went from the tropics to one of the coldest places in the world. So you, you got to see a lot of different terrain, right? Absolutely. Did that come as a shock to you? And oh, obviously, it came as a shock to you. A big shock. Um, and what kind of um, were you kind of open to the idea? Because it would it would have been on. Not at all, because uh, we were playing war games on the glaciers, and even though we were shooting blanks, uh, you know, I had been there, done that, and uh, you know, one day uh, I had uh, 
when the guys pointed the gun at me by accident, I said, wow. if you shoot, if you point that gun at someone, that means you want to shoot him. I said, if you point that gun at me again, I'm going to make you eat the barrel. And he says, yeah, you're, you're, Bob, you're jumpy. I says, yes, I am. I said, don't do it again. But he had never been exposed to real combat. And he, to him, it was just a big game. Did he and do it again? No, he never did it again. With me, it was not a game. Yeah. Because I had done the real thing for a you know, full year. So playing war games on a glacier was not... It's play time. It wasn't fun for me. Cool. Um, so when you went back from, from um, Vietnam to Alaska, it was still basically a tra kind of a training regiment, kind of a training... Right. These were all kids there that had never been... So anywhere else but Alaska. Did they send you there to like kind of expose them? Or like, was there any other motive? Not that I know of. I never asked. Okay, so, um, what else did you get? Were you awarded any, um, medals and citations? And, yeah. Uh, basically, uh, no, I never received the Purple Heart because I never got injured uh i just basically to the best of my the only knowledge like the only one i can remember was the vietnam service medal and um how did you get that one just by being in the country for a year okay. plus i was uh a sergeant e5 uh so when i got to alaska a lot of guys were promoted to sergeant in alaska but when they saw the stripes on my shoulders, they knew that uh, I was called it was like a hard five. Okay, these were not stripes I got stateside. I earned these stripes overseas. Big difference. Um, cool. So they kind of looked up to you in that regard, right? Absolutely. They knew that I was not. You were the real deal. They, I, they knew I was not an uh, FNG. They knew where I came from. Yeah. Okay. Um, and tell me about the. Um, Sort of the promotional process in the U.S. Army at the time. Well, basically, you had to go through the ranks. Uh, you know, when I first got into Vietnam, I was a private, and you basically had to pay your dues before you were uh, promoted. Uh, and of course, when I was promoted to E5, uh, I had five, six guys in my squad that were under me, so. Uh, it was my responsibility to make sure that uh, everything was in in sync. Okay. Um, and what I was wondering <coughs> is, um, obviously this isn't going to be true for your squad, um, but I've heard, I've read in this book called Fallen Angels um, that there was, um, sometimes there were lieutenants and high-ranking officers who only cared about ranking up and becoming general, and they didn't have, have as much of a regard for the safety of their um, platoon as they should have. Did you ever come across that or experience that? I never experienced anything like that, no. That's good. Um, what else? You said you um, sustained a jungle rock. Was there any, anything else? I had malaria. Malaria was that? That was from the mosquito, right? Yes, I had a temperature of 106, and I was airlifted out and sent to Cameron Bay for a week. I was packed in ice. I was fully conscious the whole time. And a week later, they sent me back into the fields. And I said to the captain, "Where's my duffel bag?" He said, "Bob, when you were gone a week, you had malaria. Your, your temperature was 106. We thought you were dead." Wow. <coughs> And uh, what kind of reception did you get when you got back? Was very it, warm. Very warm. So they were, were everybody like, was surprised to see me. These guys are like your family. Yes. And for how long um, were you with them? Well, after I had malaria, I was still back in the field for another three, four months to complete my tour. And the tour is um, a year. I was there a year to the day. Wow. Uh, so the fact that I had malaria, uh, my Tour of duty was still one year. It was not shortened by no, the fact that I had malaria. Okay. Um, 
How did you stay in touch with your family through letters? Yes. Uh, we, I stayed in touch basically on a weekly basis. What kind of um, psychological additions did keeping in touch with your family have? It gave me a big incentive to try and get through my tour of duty. It gave me something to look forward to, to know that I had family to come home to. And at that point, did you have a a, um, a wife or a girlfriend or anything? I had a girlfriend, so that gave me more incentive to <coughs> excuse me, complete my tour of duty. Yes. Um, and also, um, when you were there, what was the what was the food like? Well, we ate cheese rations for a year. I ate out of a can for a year. Dehydrated? Yes. Um, do you think you were well equipped enough? Pardon me? Were you well equipped enough? Uh, yeah, I mean, when, you, when you're hungry, you'll eat anything. And that's basically what we learned. Um, and in terms of like supplies, do you think you had enough of, of those? Uh, they used to drop us supplies once a week. We we were adequately taken care of. Yeah. Um, we never, to answer your question, we never went to bed hungry. That's good. Um, what kind of uh, pressure or stress came along with a, a job like that? I. Uh, Obviously, the fear of death. Fear of yeah. Injury. But the incentive to to know that you had friends and family back in the United States. Uh, so that's how you dealt with all the stress. You basically, you know, that once you got back, you, everything would, was it kind of a everything will be back to normal attitude, or would it be a the status quo? I I saw a lot of. Uh, Drugs overseas, I never got uh, involved in that scenario, and I'm glad I didn't because uh, some guys didn't come back because of their own negligence. Wow. <clears throat> Did you experience firsthand anything like that? Um, like with people you knew? Or no, no. Connections there? Yeah. Um, tell me what you guys did for fun. Uh, basically, when we got back to base camp once a week, uh, we used to play cards, uh, take a shower. Taking a shower was a, a, a treat because you, know, you only got to take one shower every week, 10 days when you went back to base camp. And uh, we used to just uh, play cards, listen to the uh, radio from Saigon try and find out what was going on back in the world. And uh, basically, we just counted our days. Uh, and tell me about your group dynamic you guys had. Do you have like a, good, a really close knit group of We were very close knit over there. Uh, and I attribute the fact that because of the fact that we were a very close knit group, uh, nobody in my squad ever got killed. I, I never saw. I never saw anything like that. Um, and being in the infantry for a year, I think that speaks for itself. Definitely. Uh, so when when you got there, um, the group of people you had was um, it was like right out in front of you. But did anybody come and there were people coming and going, right? All the time. How often would you say they would there be new shipments of? People coming through. Probably every couple of months. So you you saw a lot of your friends cycle through. Um, I saw a lot of guys leave. To answer your question, yeah. Um, did you guys do anything special for them once they left? Or Just wish them the best of luck and let them know we'd be right behind them. That's all. Cool. That seems, it seems like the attitude aspect of it. Very important to survive while I'm there. You had to be very positive, yeah. And what was the hardest thing about maintaining a positive attitude? Uh, the hardest thing for me was dealing with the heat. Uh, 
you, you never got used to the heat. Uh, every day was 90, 95 degrees. And I, I never got used to the heat. Plus those black jackets you had to wear. Which made it even worse in carrying all the equipment. How heavy, <coughs> how heavy was your pack on a typical day? Pardon me? How heavy was your pack on a typical day? Probably 30, 40 pounds at least. Was there anything um, that, you brought, that you brought from home to like remember your family by? Pictures, that's all. Um, sometimes I see um, helmets with um, like the ace of spades or something tucked into it. Did you have anything that you would put in your helmet? No, no, I didn't. Okay. Um, how about the USO shows? Can you tell me about some, some of those? Well, I never got to see one because we were in the infantry, but I specifically remember when they had uh, the USO show in YK. Uh, my company was right outside of YK, two, three miles guarding the perimeter. But I never got to see a USO show. The only time I saw a USO show was in a magazine. Did you ever see that very one that you protected? Well, we knew that. Or were there were multiple ones that you protected? We protect, protected probably three or four USO shows. You didn't get to see any? I never got to see a show. That doesn't seem fair. The only show I ever saw, again, not to repeat myself, was in a magazine. Um, when did you go on leave? I went to uh, Hawaii and I went to Australia. Uh, and the thing I remember most about Hawaii was one day I met my fiance there. We were walking down the street. And the car backfired. And when I heard the car backfire, I hit the pavement. And everybody stopped to look at me. They thought I passed out for some reason. And then I jumped right up. And everybody was looking at me like, what's the matter with you? I says, I just came out of Vietnam. I'm here on my R&R. &R. And then they understood why I hit the pavement when that car backfired. That's how jumpy I was. Wow. Um, how long after the war ended do you think you were, not to say paranoid, or, but like wary of things like that? Uh, when I got home, I was just glad to be home. I adjusted very well. I never That's good. had any serious issues to deal with. And I've, I've heard about um, some people who come back and they kind of feel a loss of purpose in their life after being on a squad. Um, especially. No, I was, I was, I felt proud that I had served my country. Uh, and I was just glad to be back and I appreciated everything in life more than I ever did before because I saw what it was like being on the other side of the fence. Um, yeah, so did you, did you start to see, um, yeah, like I said before, it was a very cultural experience for you. Um, do you still? What was like the, one of the most important things you think you learned over there? How to be self-sufficient. Because if you didn't perform a task, nobody was going to do it for you. Yeah, it's like my, my grandpa's quote. He was in World War II. Um, if I want some damn fool to do it, I'll do it myself, he used to say. That's, he was exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, did you, did you keep a journal of anything? Not that I can recall. Um, and uh, we've discussed this before. Um, did you think the officers, or what did you think of the officers and fellow servicemen? I thought they performed their, filled their positions very well. They never tried to pull rank on us, if that's what you're getting at. Uh, and they treated us all the same. Okay, cool. And um, let's see. After service, uh, or is there anything else that you you want to tell me about, like the the daily life of being in service? Uh, the thing I remember the most was uh, when I got out of the service. Uh, when somebody asked me where was I in the service and I told him I was in Vietnam. Uh, 
we did not get a warm reception when we came home. There were too many anti-war protests going on. Uh, and whether I agreed with the fact or not, whether we should be there or not, uh, I was proud to serve my country, and I just never made a big issue of it. But we never did get a warm reception. We didn't get any parades or anything like that, not like today. You know, today when I watch the news, sometimes all I can do is laugh. I saw it on TV the other night. This uh, fella came home, and his wife and kids met him at the airport. He, he was in Afghanistan six months, and I'm there talking to the television like, big deal, you were there six months. What's the big deal? I was, six months is not a tour. A normal tour, as far as I was concerned, was a year. And he's... He had a big welcoming committee. He's home six months. He was gone six months, and he was treated like he was gone for six years when he came back. <coughs> six months. And I think you feel like you guys did more than you get credit for. A lot more. I think so too. A lot more. Yeah. We just don't talk about it. Um, where do you think that hesitation to talk about it comes from? Just the. Uh, because I'm basically the type of guy, and I don't, I don't tell war stories. You know, and if I started talking about my experiences overseas. It, they would not be inflated. Um, so is that is that everything you wanted to add on daily life in, in combat? Pretty much, yeah. Cool. Okay, so after service, um, where were you when you served at? I was ending my service in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, tell me about that day and being discharged. Ah, uh, it was probably one of the happiest days of my life. Uh, when I left Anchorage, uh, it was 10 below zero. When I got into New York, it was 28 above. And I took off a couple of shirts and sweaters that I had on and my fiance and my friends and family said, Bob, it's freezing here. I said, I thought it was 50 degrees. Because where I left, it was 10 below, and I went from 10 below to 28 above. Wow. <laughs> A difference of almost 40 degrees. Yeah, that's true. My um, body was wrecked. <laughs> yeah, that, that leads me to my next question. What kind of um, physical effect did the war leave on you? Uh, well, I, I have several issues I'm dealing with now. I had a, a stomach heart disease. Uh, I have a substantial hearing loss. I have COPD. So I have several physical issues that I have to deal with. But uh, I'm glad to be in one piece, and I'm glad that I served my country. I have no regrets. The thing that I remember the most, to answer your question, uh, and, when, and during my time of service, it was a big thing, uh, draft dodgers. And if I saw a draft dodger, I'd probably shoot him. You know, uh, you know, it's like everybody used to say, love it or leave it. If you don't love this country, then get the hell out. You know, but uh, I could never understand why somebody would be a draft dodger. You don't hear about that today, but no, you don't. But it, court life at first, I guess. But because of all the anti-war protests and everything during Vietnam, uh, you probably heard about draft dodgers for a good ten years. <coughs> yeah, and I feel like almost the anti-war um, parades and stuff like that almost gave them a justification to do it. I figured if they wanted to do it, let them do it. I just didn't get involved one way or another. Um, and then after service, also, uh, what was the first thing you did when you got back? I enjoyed having a hot meal with my friends and family. Nice. And um, what did you do in the days and weeks afterwards? Pardon me? What did you do in the days and weeks afterwards? Uh, I took about a month to just regroup, and then I went back to my 
previous employer, previous employer who hired me before I got drafted. So I was all I was fortunate. Uh, they gave me all my uh, salary increments, and uh, they were happy to see me back in the Vietnam War. Nice. And um, did they at least appreciate you? Pardon me? Did they at least appreciate your services? Yes, they did. They, they, they took me back with open arms. Nice. Um, and since you, went, since you went back to the, uh, after you went back to the States, did you get any education supported by the GI Bill? No. Um, obviously, you made a lot of close friendships in the service. You, you said that's what contributed to the um, the low or no mortality rate in your squad. Um, do, you, do you keep any of those relationships? Uh, yes, I do. I've tried to stay in touch with, with them, uh, either by phone or by letters. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, all my uh, associates were from out of state. I'm right. from Connecticut. Um, did you, or what did you do, or what was the job that you went back to after Vietnam? Uh, I was a driver salesman for Coca Cola. Nice. I was only 21 years old. At that time, one of the most American things there, right? Pardon me? One of the most American things around at that time. That's right. <laughs> nice. It was baseball, hot dogs, <laughs> apple pie, and Chevrolet. <laughs> um, how did your military experience concern your thinking about war or the military in general? Uh, I just think we should try and uh, pay more attention to this country and uh, less attention to these foreign countries. We have our own problems to deal with here, and it seems like uh, sometimes we pay more attention to problems in these other countries than people that are living right here in the United States. Uh, to give you a specific example, Superstorm Sandy, which was still in New Jersey, some of those people are never going to go back home. Uh, some of those people are having problems getting financial aid. Uh, and it seems like uh, there's still a lot of... Uh, Serious problems in this country that nobody seems to be addressing. And Superstorm Sandy, Superstorm Sandy is definitely one of the big issues that a lot of people are still dealing, still dealing with right now. Um, and as for the um, military aspect, um, in, do you think the military in America is? Way more powerful than it used to be, or do you think it's just a different? No, I think we're where we should be. Um, let's see. Did you join any veterans programs? Uh, I'm a lifetime member of the DAV. I'm also a member of local VFW, and I also belong to the American Legion. Uh, and I support all these organizations because I'm a veteran, and I'm, I'm proud that I'm a veteran. And all these veteran organizations, um, they, um, they help veterans get the help they need? Yeah, they help get veterans get what they, uh, the help they need, but it's, it's nice to uh, be associated with individuals that have gone through the same thing you did. Uh, you know, you know you, you, when I go to a meeting at the American Legion or the BFW or the DAV, uh, I always have a lot of con lot in common with all these individuals because we've all been there and we've all done that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, how did your service and experiences um, affect your life? Uh, I could tell you that in one easy sentence. Uh, joining, the, being in the military, you mature very quickly. 
as an individual, uh, from a young man to a young adult. Uh, because if you don't, you're not gonna, you wouldn't have survived. Uh, you grow up real quick. And you appreciate life more in general. You appreciate what you have. I, I just feel honored today that uh, I was invited to come down here and participate in this program. Yeah, I'm I, I really enjoyed being here this afternoon, and uh, I really feel like I made a contribution to be an integral part of this program. Yeah. And I, I'm happy that I, I came down here, even though it's a horrible day out there, weather-wise. It's horrible. It's tough to get out. I wouldn't send my dog out on a day like today. <laughs> Sleep, freeze, or rain, it was, it's not a pleasant day out there. No, it's not at all. All right, well, I'd like to thank you for your service, and for the time that you have made the end of the year today. Okay, thank all you right, very sorry. much.